Hi, Chris Newman here. We are continuing our talk on the Treaty of Waitangi, which uh, some want to declare as New Zealand's founding document. We can explore that topic at another time, but right now I want to dive into one word and the meaning of associated with it, rangatira and rangatira tanga. Uh, first I'll start referring to a copy of this book called The Littlewood Treaty by Martin Dutre, a fascinating account of the first week prior to the signing of the treaty in February 6, 1840. And in it is a copy of uh, the treaty in Māori, the Māori language, which was the one which was signed by all the participants. And it mentions the word rangatira quite frequently and uh, mentions the word rangatiratanga once. So let's dive into this word. A rangatira is a chief. It's a chief. And it's a chief of a, of a Maori tribe. And the tanga is a word that was added on in the treaty language to mean the matters of the chief or the chiefly affairs, whatever. Now, in the Polynesian Tribal Society in New Zealand, the chief had power over life and death. He had power to lead war parties, his body was considered sacred, and all those under him were his vassals. His vassals. So he had vassals and he also had slaves. A vassal is someone who's subservient, and then there's a slave. So when we're talking about the rangatiratanga system, we are referring to vassals who are all his followers and all those who must bow to him, who owe him their allegiance, and over whom he has power, absolutely. And the slaves who, of course, uh, their lives are in the balance. They could be cooking in the kitchen or they could be the food in the pot. This is the power a chief had over life and death. Let's go further. The rangatiratanga is mentioned in the treaty because the power of the chief is recognised by uh, the treaty itself. Now, moving on, the, the rangatiratanga system, or the chief system of the chief, is dependent on what we call tikanga. Tikanga being uh, the tribal law. Now, this is law is not written; it's a um, oral or vocal, verbally expressed, and it comes in four elements, and I'll just quickly break those down, though there's, it could be considered five. The first one is the tapu, which is the holy story, but it also, uh, the holy story of the tapu also includes a thing called the whakapapa, which is the lineage, whakapapa. Now that is your lineage, and that, if you recite your whakapapa, that tells everybody who you are. And if you're a real high caste rangatira, your whakapapa gives you uh, elevated status over everybody else. The next part of the system is what we call mana. Now mana is your standing status, and it's also pride. Um, the next one which follows is a very interesting topic called muru, M-U-R-U, -U, which is to pluck or to plunder. And this is the right of those in power and control to seize or use the assets of others for their personal or for collective um, good, you might say. And the final word is utu. And utu is payback, it's reciprocity, and it's also revenge. Now, this system works entirely on the authority of the chief, who's there to ensure that these codes are observed and all the members of the tribe who are either his vassals or his slaves, participate in it. So when people talk about, and even in modern times, rangatiratanga, and we need our rangatiratanga, what they really are referring to is our authority over you and over others, because you must become our vassals and our slaves. Why? Because 
Our holy story is that we are the people of this place and you are not. And you, if you're an outsider to us, you don't have a whaka papa and you're not linked into the rangatira system, you therefore are inferior, a vassal or a slave. It's a second class position. And this is what is meant by keeping our rangatira tanga when the Maori delegates say this, the Maori party talk about this all the time. Now, we have to understand the holy story is what is the story that's made up to justify and support the mana. And the mana is my standing, and that's why you might see people with tattooed heads and carrying big stones around their neck that are carved in tiki form and so on. This is expressing their mana. And some of them want to wear cowboy hats too, which is interesting. And so this is all boost, boosting up the position of pride. And based on that, they claim entitlement to plunder or take from others what they consider are their resources, our land, our this, our that, you know. And then the final part, when this is accomplished, the point of revenge and payback, now we put things back in balance. Except, under this system, there never can be any balance. Because everything will always be out of balance. Why? Because Utu demands payback. So if you take stuff from somebody, that other person at some stage in the future is going to want a payback from you for what you took from them. So this system creates an endless go-round of tribal law leads to tribal war. And this is the whole thing. Tribal war. And tribal war is justified by the holy story Back to mana, our status, our pride is upset. We're entitled to plunder and take back what's ours. And we're back into, you know, the plunder and then we're back into revenge. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an endless cycle of um, strife and upset. That is the tikanga law system, which the chiefs and tribes in 1840, with complete consent, surrendered forever to join the rest of New Zealand in the Treaty of Waitangi Agreement. So what the Treaty of Waitangi is, is a common law, which is the uh, British system. It's a common law agreement, and the Treaty of Waitangi could never be tikanga. And it could never, ever be that. Now... In terms of rangatiratanga, the treaty leaves that to a degree because there are certain practices which rangatira were doing which were fine, such as, you know, keeping everybody um, in order, making sure the crops were planted, making sure that agreements were made and kept among themselves, keeping a certain degree of law and order, sort of like a mayor of a village. This is about... Uh, the level that it operates on as a mayoral, the village mayor. And with you, when you understand that, that the rangatira is roughly a, a village mayor, you begin to see how it was that at the time of the treaty, everyone thought, yeah, that's okay. However, the idea was that the common folk would join everybody else under common law so there'd be no more vassals and slaves, none. Everyone becomes people, not tribe members. It can't be tribal control. And yet, to this day, the tribal control system is operating on the marais and is operating under the radar. And that is a violation of the Treaty of Waitangi where everyone are people and they are free. So this little overview explains the basics around the rangatira idea, and it also reveals why it is that, from a political uh, perspective, why the rangatira tanga is being asserted by those who would like to twist the meaning of the treaty, destroy the common law, and reassert their tikanga, and their control and make the rest of us their vassals and their slaves and second class 
citizens, is as it were. That's on a legal level. Okay, it's Chris Newman, a brief overview of a hot topic, the Rangatiratanga, as it relates to the Treaty of Waitangi and freedom for the people in New Zealand.